Hello, friends. Um, um, for those who don't know me, my name is Ross Rowe, and I am the multi -admi multimedia administrator. I still haven't gotten used to saying that. Uh, for the village of Elk Grove Village, Illinois, which, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is right next to O'Hare Airport. So, you know, you go down to the end of Concourse B, and we're right just past the Cinnabon. So, just to let you know, nobody ever laughs at that joke. I don't know why I keep telling it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and today's session is Choosing Remote Broadcasting Equipment and Strategies for Producing Successful Live Remote Broadcasts. And we have some speakers who are uh, experts in this field who are going to talk about uh, issues related to that. The One of the cool things about this is that we are, uh, the three speakers, including myself, are all from three different sized organizations. Uh, my organization is a, a, a suburb of about 36,000 residents. So mine is actually smaller compared to our other two speakers. Uh, Patrick Cook, who is the technical services manager for uh, Nine North, yeah, it's the new name. Yes, that's the new name. Um, who is in the suburbs of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And then uh, Jim Knightwright, who is a operations uh, supervisor, coordinator, operations coordinator at CAN TV, which is the public access uh, in Chicago. Uh, so we're basically talking about three different sizes of operations in this particular case. Um, I want to, at the outset, encourage you that this is not just a lecture. We want to hear from you about what you're doing. Uh, because I don't know about you, but I always pick up something in these sessions that I may not have thought of. And everybody's in a different situation. So we want you to, uh, to talk. We're gonna each take about 10 minutes to talk and then we'll leave, we'll do questions at the end. And I want it to be more than questions and we, we want it to be a discussion about what you guys are doing. So um, don't be surprised if I pick on you uh, I'm talking to Jeff and Will and Lisa and maybe some other people. So uh, with that, uh, I guess I'm going to start. So obviously the first time, the first, one of the first things you have to consider is what kind of programming do you do? Uh, in my particular case, I am a government access channel. So I don't have volunteer producers or, um, you know, I, I use freelancers for producing a lot of the programming we do, plus whatever our staff comes up with. And yet, we do all of these. Uh, sports, concerts, parades, local meetings, interviews, uh, single camera shoots, we do it all. The next question you have to ask yourself is how sophisticated do you want your production to be? And of course, there are budgetary constraints with this. There are labor constraints. It's really hard to do uh, a three camera shoot if you don't have three camera people. And so you have to think about, you know, am, am, I, going, am I doing something basic? Like I, I consider, uh, for example, a meeting uh, of a local commission is kind of basic. Uh, Multi-camera, we do, in my particular case, I have robotic cameras that I use for, um, for the meetings that I do. Uh, and I also have, and you'll see it in a little later, uh, I have a robotic uh, suitcase that I use uh, for things like actually high school basketball and things of that nature. So you kind of, that's something else you've got to think about. 
I've always said that the audience, your audience, knows what good video production looks like, even if they don't know the terminology. They've watched TV, they know, you know, they know what a good shot is, what a bad shot is, they know what good audio is, they know what bad audio is, they know what good editing is. They know what bad editing is. And so it's important that you pick the te technology that will give you the best result within the budget you have to work with. You know, and so I always, I always tell people do as much research as you can on your purchases. You know, figure out what you're going to use it for, uh, how you're going to use it. Figure, try to figure that all out before you even pull out the credit card. Figure that all out. Now, our production setup includes uh, a four camera production truck. Now, we do not have, uh, and I'm sure Patrick will talk about his truck, uh, but m our truck, we had to put it together ourselves. And so the, uh, the village that I work for, I'm a government employee, uh, they donated an ambulance to us. And so we, we made our production truck out of an ambulance. Uh, tore out all the old stuff. Uh, we left the IV hangers because that was kind of cool. But um, we did everything else. We put in, we used the various doors and storage that the truck already had. And then the only thing was we added, uh, we added racks, short racks, that we could mount the, the majority of our production in. Uh, and then on, you can't see it on this, in this picture, but on the other side of the truck, uh, inside two of the compartments are generators that we have uh, for places in which we have to use it. Like when we do football, for example, uh, there's no power source. The, the, the truck can also be tied into shore power. So, but it, I'd say overall it cost us probably probably about a hundred thousand to convert everything, and that's considering the truck was the truck was free. We had it revert, we had it refurbished, and then uh, you know we sat down and the the nice guys at the uh, vehicle maintenance uh, basically we gave them the plan and they put it together. And it didn't really take that long. It took about three months. And, uh, and since then, we've converted it, the cameras to fiber. Um, but the truck is still plugging along. It had, it's a 2001, but it only has 52,000 miles on it because it was only used within Elk Grove Village. So the truck's actually in really good shape and we figure it's going to be another five or six years before we'll finally have to replace it. But that's an example of us kind of using stuff we already had. Uh, and I'm huge on that. We also have a four camera suitcase studio. And these, this is what we use for our some of our indoor sports and, and events. Uh, we started using this for our uh, basketball uh, and badminton. Uh, yes, minton, don't forget, there's a T. Um, uh, games. And we had to do this because uh, the high school added a, uh, a wing and our truck cameras, the cables wouldn't reach anymore. So we couldn't use the truck to get to the get to the gym. So we had to put together this suitcase. It was mostly put together out of things that we already had. Uh, we had had a suitcase studio from before. Um, and then, uh, so the only thing we had to buy was the switchers and the monitors. We already had the cameras. By the way, our cameras sort of do triple duty. They're used in this 
configuration. We have another smaller suitcase that we have, and then we also use them for our single camera ENG shoots. So it was port important to have something that not only had could make great pictures and great sound, but uh, could be easily used in different types of production situations. Uh, and then, of course, we also do, as I said, we do uh, single camera shirt shoots. Uh, and those cameras, like I said, those cameras do triple duty. Um, so when we need to, when we're doing things like these are both police and fire, um, in those particular situations, uh, we can easily flex to and do um, all kinds of different stuff. I should mention that the, uh, the, the thing you saw on the last slide, the production system, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had to reduce the amount of people we were using. And so I had a set of PTZ cameras that we had recently replaced. Uh, we do park district meetings and their building is about a mile away from our building uh, and we had just replaced them so we took those cameras and uh, the controller that came with them I think I went on eBay and bought a controller for like a couple hundred bucks uh, and now the suitcase setup is controlled can only you only need a crew of three where before we would have to have at least five or six people uh, doing it um, so one person is handling all the cameras and one person's directing and handling the switcher and the third person does audio and graphics so it uh, it has worked out really well for us and and the mayor even gave us an attaboy uh, in publicly for doing that and so that's uh, that's something that we really appreciate um, when you're purchasing equipment, uh, I know there are a lot of people out there who are afraid of used items. I say, don't be afraid. I treat, I buy some used items and I treat it as if I'm buying a car, a used car. I do my homework. If the, it is possible to get somebody knowledgeable to look at it before you buy it, do that. Only takes only takes a, a phone call in a few minutes, and you've got uh, you may have something that you can use within your systems. I realize that the used gear, um, the, the used gear atmosphere has changed because now, of course, what's happening now is that a lot of that first HD equipment that came out like 10 years ago is now showing up in the used market. And so um, that might be something that you can use, um, you know, to, if you're low on funds or you don't have a restricted budget. Um, I, I recycle a lot of equipment. Uh, you know, I put it, if it's not working at one, if I need to replace one, at one place, I can move it to the next place, get a few more years out of it. So, so I, I tell people, don't be afraid of used equipment. Just do your homework, do your research, and you know it works out. And like I say, like they say with a used car, you don't have to buy it. <laughs> you know, if it comes out that it's not working for you, then you know, skip it. Okay, hey, thanks for listening. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Pat, and he will talk about things at Nine North. Yes. All right, there we go. Thank you. See how this comes up. All right. Not what I want. Okay. 
Okay. What? Didn't go where I wanted it to. Sorry about that. All right. All right. There we got it. Um, so, again, thanks for having me. Um, hopefully we'll get um, stuff out of this. I'm going to talk about some specific instances that we're using at Nine North um, to do these things. So, uh, again, as Ross you know, sort of said, what are you trying to do? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, kinds of productions that um, or ways to do a production, a remote production, uh, traditional things, production trucks, fly packs. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about a laptop solution we have, and then some new thinking um, things that the um, um, is coming across in the industry, and things that are accessible to us too. Um, I think which is remote integration. So that's um, where not everybody's in the same place, um, but the production is happening. Uh, so first of all, here's our. Um, a little mini mobile system um, that we use. Um, it's a Mac laptop running Wirecast software. Um, Wirecast, um, you buy it or you can now, as all software people do, they take so much a month from you. Um, but uh, OBS is another option, um, which is um, free and open, open uh, shareware, and as well as, or open sourced, I mean, as well as um, um, Drawn to Blake. Uh, VMix is another option. Um, we're using um, Blackmagic interfaces or um, AJA um, interfaces. The the um, Blackmagic box um, is just a. It's actually a DeckLink card in a Sonnet box, but it has four um, I/O ports, so we can have up to th um, up to you know we can have multiple cameras in or and an output. Um, or the little mini converters work well as um, work well as well. The um, um, Blackmagic um, Ultra Studio, I like that because it has both SDI and HDMI in. Although you have to pick one in software. Um, the um, AJA UTAP, you need to pick when you buy the interface which you're going to use. But those make it easy to run your camera into um, into the laptop. And what we use this for a lot of times is like we're doing a library program. And we just want to be able to pick up the presentation. We want to be able to um, show the show the person speaking. We want to title it. Um, and by adding the laptop, that allows us to add those things uh, from a single camera shoot. It also allows us to record it to disk with all the programming enhancements and to stream it um, out to um, um, either social media or back to our facility. And if you um, want to join us. Um, tomorrow now, um, we'll talk more about how we're doing the streaming of the software. Um, and I'm envious of the case here, and I know a number of you are talking about your cases. That's something we need to put in um, to our facility, but right now, um, that's sort of some looks at the system with a bigger setup, um, doing a similar to what Ross had said, is we had um, uh, two pan tilt zoom cameras. We're actually using a um, uh, a mast, a mast that you would use in a football field, but I put a mount on it so I can hang two PTZ cameras, one on either side. It works well in a medium-sized meeting room because you're up, up um, to have those cameras get the angles. And, and then we had a third camera um, that brought everything in. And you can see the operator station and the mess of wires. So again, that's the downside of this system is that if, if we're rewiring it every or we're wiring it every time, it's flexible, but it's not neat and it doesn't save as much labor. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Quad Cities t television. Um, Quad Cities um, are four suburbs, um, Minneapolis suburbs, um, to the northwest of us. And they're doing something really interesting. These folks that are in the picture, John Summer, um, CJ Luck, um, and Taylor Johnson, they used to actually used to work with us and we, we do a lot of cooperative stuff. We share programming over an interconnect that we have. Um, what they were doing at the beginning of the pandemic um, is this, the, they were still doing sports or it might be right after they came back to doing sports with their limiting who was in the venue. Um, so what they did is they sent out three cameras 
um, each with a live view. They borrowed our live view and used that to send this, this three distinct signals back to their control room. So I, to me, this was a great solution because you've already got, if you have a control room or you have a fixed site, you can leverage that equipment you already have in that space to do remote productions. Plus it has a um, simpler, a smaller footprint um, on the, in the site because they only had the actually two camera operators. The third camera at the first shoot was pointing at the clock so that they had that. And they can also then scale that up or down. Um, CJ calls them light production. So again, it might be a library talk. He just sends out the camcorder. They send back the signal and he adds the graphics and the intro and outro um, uh, graphics right there from the studio. So here's some of the technology that they're using. Um, they're using Live View, um, Comrex, uh, TVU. There's a number of other choices out there. Um, some are more expensive than others. Some need data plans, some don't. Um, I, we have Comrex and Live View. Um, I really like them both. Um, and if you get a chance, talk to the Comrex um, folks out there. Um, he's showing a lot of radio and audio things, but their live shot um, product comes in both a uh, rack mount and the portable unit and um, work well. Um, they have an announcer setup that they have, and then they also have the um, um, score hub, um, which allows them to connect to um, the scoreboard. So they're using, for the cameras, wireless. Um, they're using the TVU, uh, or sorry, the live view. Um, here's some other options um, that I just mentioned. Um, one of the interesting things with this is that, of course, if you have separate encoders coming back, is how do you keep them in time? And that's probably the biggest trick with this, in my, in my thoughts, is that um, we did a shoot where we had two live view and one Comrex. And the live view were pretty good about staying in the same time. And when I'm talking time, I'm talking the same second. You know, if you're doing sports and you're set back, it's not that critical that you're, uh, you know, um, frame accurate. Um, but the Comrex kept shifting. It kept adjusting its buffer to get a better pic picture. Um, and we had to keep restarting it. Um, I think if I dug deeper into the Comrex, I probably could have locked that in, sacrificed some quality, but keep the time the same. Um, but that was one of the issues um, that we ran into. Uh, but there are also on the market now a number of four-channel um, or multi-channel encoders. Again, the, the uh, Makito um, 4X, the uh, LiveView LU800, and the Matrix Monarch Edge are a couple of them. And those um, are a single box with multiple encoders. They're designed to be either 4HD or 4K, and that's one of the pushes for them. But what you can do with that is you can run um, three or four cameras into that one box and it will come out the other end um, frame accurate. The downside is if you're in a venue um, and you've got cameras on the sideline or behind the baskets, um, you now need to run a cable again. But you know, my thinking is along the sense of um, a truck is expensive and while this gear is expensive, it could be less than a truck, in which case you can have your studio control room set up, but it could also be your live um, production control room. Um, this is one of the really clever pieces that I think Taylor put together, um, which is his announcer station. So this announcer station, he basically took the ClearCom boxes that he had in the truck, he powers them locally, runs it into a one rack unit mixer that's back in there, um, and, then with it, and then has an audio interface for an iPad, and he runs Zoom on it. So basically he opens up a Zoom meeting between the control room and this announcer station. And what that allows them to do is to have um, not only uh, IFB to the announcers, the announcer's audio is still being fed through the cameras back to the control room, but it does give them IFB to the announcers. Um, they can monitor program, so if they're running replays or in a break, the announcers can see it. And it does give them a, sort of a peekaboo camera because the iPad's camera is looking at the announcer, so they don't use that for the production, but it allows them to see are they, are they standing there, are they not, you know, what's going on. Um, and that's all done through a single network connection. They've used uh, uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot for that, um, or it can be plugged in um, wirelessly. And then the score hub, um, and I'm not as familiar with this, but it allows you to hook up um, your scoreboard to your scoreboard, um, either wirelessly or through a serial cable, and it can transmit that. They initially bought it to transmit it back to the truck. 
but they found during the pandemic they could also send it up to the cloud and then when it uh, comes down from the cloud they can integrate that again back into their control room um, and for replays one of the things that they did is they had replaced their replay system in their truck um, with a newer one and they were looking to sell the old replay system but realized that whoa if we're doing this kind of stuff we could install this back in the studio um, it um, so that's one of the things that they're doing so I'm gonna give a thank you to Taylor and uh, CJ um, they uh, I talked to them quite extensively on that but I thought it was a really cool um, thing that they were doing I wanted to share that um, with you guys uh, another uh, thing that we're doing and this is it's uh, this is with our council chambers but it, it some of these things um, work into this is what we're doing is um, doing um, we've started doing one our smallest city got some new equipment which finally matches all of our other cities and we started doing um, during the pandemic um, when everything was virtual we had set up the control rooms they happened to have equipment that all had some kind of interface either software for the for the um, uh, Ross carbonite switcher it has dashboard um, the um, Blackmagic ATM also has um, a software panel um, we also have the Panasonic um, pan tilt zoom cameras which all have a web interface or they make a software call that runs those um, and the Makito stream deck so basically for the pandemic we were doing when the people were remote our operator was also remote and we ran everything um, one of the things we did is when people started coming back in is my thought was if they're in the council chambers I need the operator in the building as well but for Lauderdale they're small enough and this um, equipment is actually in the council chambers um, that's how small they are um, and they typically had a staff person doing it um, who wasn't always he was part of the meeting as well so a lot of times the wide shot where I would prefer to see a close-up of who's talking um, so what we did what we're doing now is we actually are um, running these meetings remotely um, so our operator who for quite a few years was a great operator lived in the Twin Cities decided to move to Chicago um, when we were doing the entirely remote meetings he was able to operate everything from Chicago um, but now with Lauderdale we're actually having them operate the cameras as well so some of the software we're using for that is um, uh, we're using a Elgato stream deck and in with the um, uh, bit focus companion software and if you're not every who's familiar with the stream deck raise hands okay you should look into the stream deck it's a uh, it's ostensibly a, a button panel and it was um, it's big in use for gamers who stream but every button a 32 button panel everything's programmable but because it's uh, more mainstream than just broadcast it's 250 bucks you know so it's really cheap it's basically a membrane over a screen so every button can be configured you can put little icons you can put pictures you can do a whole bunch of stuff with them um, and make it very customizable it also um, has with the companion software we'll talk to the Ross um, expression graphics it'll talk to the carbonite um, it'll talk to the Panasonic cameras I can put pan tilt zoom from them um, I also can um, uh, control the audio system uh, but we are also running um, Panasonic software the, the Ross dashboard um, in uh, those separate things but here's a picture of the stream deck in the, the lower corner here um, one of the things that the companion software does it also gives you web panels so what we've done when Misha is in Chicago running this show is we've pulled up two different panels and he can use those buttons he actually isn't even physically pressing the buttons <laughs> he's using the buttons that are on um, his screen part of his screen to control it so he can select the cameras on the bottom he can select presets for the cameras up top um, he can uh, select what's on the monitors in the room that's what the purple buttons are um, and then the the other panel there most of them are graphics presets and turning the graphics on and off so before the show he comes in he makes his rundown and expression um, he knows what each number of the page is and he links it so while this is happening he can just press each one of those buttons uh, so that's 
the things I wanted to talk about, I guess I want to mention one more thing related to that is for, we have, like Ross said, we also have a truck. Um, and when we were getting back into production, of course, trying to limit who's in the truck and using, uh, again, using um, a VNC um, or even a remote control software like TeamViewer, we had Misha running our graphics from Chicago. Again, we used Zoom to create an interconnect. We could see each other. Um, he saw program so that he had, he knew it was on program. And then by sharing the screen, it allowed him to virtually control that computer, which saved us somebody being in the truck. It also gave us some um, reliable help. Um, Zoom generally has low enough la latency that he could um, he could deal with everything in real time. And of course, with our council meetings, you have to, you know, switch cameras in real time. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll stop there. But that's sort of some some thoughts on different ways of using technology and doing remote um, productions. Is he going to plug that in? Or? Next, we have uh, Jim Knightwright from uh, Can TV in Chicago, and he will talk about this uh, beautiful case that <laughs> he brought for us. So. I guess we'll do it like that. way to do this they never make these things wide enough have you ever done those <laughs> I'm from Chicago, where the Chicago Access Corporation is uh, runs Can TV. We're a uh, not-for-profit. Uh, been around for a few years now, and uh, uh, we operate five channels on Chicago's cable cha access. Uh, we do city council meetings, and we do some different uh, like police board meetings and things like that. That will carry. Let me take this off. So you can hear me. Ah. We do do those, but um, uh, we're primarily a public access set. So our stuff is set around. Our, we're centered around equipment that people can check out or use, and so our our our, our focus is on that. Um, one of the, the pieces of equipment we have is called a studio in a box. And this is something that we've had for a few years now that we've had we've, we, that we let people check out a three camera remote studio, um, and it's got the three cameras that are you can see that. Um, what it looks like is this: we require that you take two people to check it out because it's too heavy for people to move, and 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 that's always been a concern. And the other thing is is that you can only record, and you can't you, you can take it out, record something, and bring it back. But record, doing it live required more than what we had infrastructure for. So what we've been working toward is something that is this, which is right here. And, and I'll tell you that right now we're in the shakedown, and staff's been evaluating it and going through things. And I'll show you some, some, some quirks that we found that we didn't like uh, that as we and I get to the end. But uh, this is our new device, and we haven't necessarily decided whether to call it a studio in a box or what. But uh, we probably come up with some other fancy name for people to check it out and still continue to, because the studio in the box still works. It's it's actually scheduled to go out on Saturday, so it's uh, um, 
In fact, that's one of the things I'm doing Saturday morning is checking out the studio in the box for someone. So it's, uh, um, but it's something we still keep keep working with. This is basically built around, um, I'm going away from my notes, um, around the uh, Blackmagic ATM Mini Pro and uh, basically a four channel switcher which can do a limited number of effects and cutting or, or dissolving between them. Um, and uh, and it also is we're working with a stick PC. We, we've got an a Wow NY forty one S, which is a, just a, a you, I put a mouse in the picture so you can see the size of the PC for this. Uh, it's small and it's it's I I think it was about like three hundred dollars four hundred dollars something like that for the for the stick PC. Um, it's running a uh, a Celeron. Um, wrote it down. Celeron, uh, the J4105 processor is what it's got on it. So it's, it's not even a high processor as far as what it's doing for the, for the stuff. Because the switching and stuff, the, the, the Blackmagic uh, is doing a lot of that, that heavy work with that. So it's a, um, and also we have a router which is really buried in there. And I didn't get to find a picture for it. I got the picture looking behind the monitor there. Uh, but it's just a little four inch by four inch router that's a four four output port, port, a five port router that's under there. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, this one is a make critic. You could, you can get a lot of them, but, but I tried back uh, looking these things up the other day. It's, it's just like, there's a, there's a million of them out there. That's, uh, and they're, and the big, th so anyway, the way this works is we've got the, you start with the ATM, the PC and the router, and it goes up to, we use Amazon Web Services, and that sends it to our CAN TV Master Control, which in turn can turn it around and ship it out to uh, cable channels, web pages, social media. It could go shipped out to a studio control room, which in turn, like the studio control room, could in turn get shipped out to a, to a channel, which is actually happening right now. Uh, we're connected to, to Chicago at this moment, so if you go to www.cantv.org slash live, if you feel like doing this on your own thing, you could see the return feed. It's about 30 seconds behind um, for coming back here to, to Madison. Um, in fact, I can do it. Um, maybe. We'll see if the hotel will let me do it with everybody else. It's a, um, and maybe not on this one. Oh, there we go. And they just stuck it on, oh, they, they did put the next thing up there, good. Um, and I'm gonna kill the audio on this because it, it does give a feedback that's kind of weird. But the audio's working too. Um, so we've got, uh, right now we can, have up to th we can have up to four cameras connected in and the ATM will, also through the network will will connect to your cell phone if you've got a if you've got a if you're off of the off of a particular type of ride or so you could add other cameras that way too to the to the atm which makes it pretty versatile as far as that this is designed to be a live stream back to the, the thing so the, the, uh, the what we're seeing here now oh they turned it off that's, 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 that's they had it routed through one of our control rooms uh, the control room we use for city council meetings and board, police board meetings and stuff, and they were titling it, uh, so it's not there anymore. But and, and what do we got punched up? Um, so maybe I'm not seeing it anymore. I'm not seeing it over there. I'm seeing it here. That's why. Okay. Anyway, I'll I'll leave this running, but the. Uh, the joys of PowerPoint. Oh, I know what I can do. I didn't even think of that. I can. There it is. Just where it popped up the window. And I think I can. There we go. So um, this whole setup is all off the shelf uh, components. Um, and the setup that is running right here right now cost about, uh, uh, I want to say 
2000 $2,500 for this setup, for these cameras. When staff first started looking at the setup, one of the things that, that uh, they had a concern with were the cameras. Zooming these are really difficult. Trying to use them, their, their lens throw isn't very good. So they're upgrading the cameras for this and they're in the process now. I saw them, they're, they're in, the, in the room and the cameras are, uh, are gonna be JVCs and I don't remember what model. Um, but they, it upped the cost of this package now to about $5,000 for the whole setup. Um, so that wasn't too bad. You go a little higher if you want and you can get a lens with a better throw. It's the, the glass on the cameras is really kind of like the, the big expensive part of the whole thing. Um, and uh, uh, let me take a look. The way the case is set up, um, and, and my engineer said, if you want to build one of these, you know, feel free to copy. It's, it's okay. But if you're going to sell it, we did put it in apply for a pack. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, but you're welcome to build one for yourself. It's no problem. Um, basically, we've got a wireless keyboard, a wireless mouse, um, and the remote is really only to turn on the monitors. Um, it's just easier than trying to reach and get to a button underneath here. Uh, these have a limited amount of movement that they can do in the case, but that also makes it sturdier for the traveling and bouncing around. In theory, you can take this on a bus, uh, and we do have a lot of users who are uh, using public transit. We would strongly discourage that. <laughs> uh, 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 let's see. But they, 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 there's a compartment here for, for holding all of these components, including the, three, the, the cameras, uh, for putting them in there. What's going to happen and as we go to the next department? Or some of it come with the we made it. We made this whole thing. It was just this is a piano case, piano okay. keyboard case. It's, um, uh, but it's nice and thin. Uh, the idea is that it would fit in the back seat of a car. I can tell you that it does not fit in the back seat of a Versa. This <laughs> <laughs> is what I drive. Um, so it, 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 I took out that my seats go down, so I fit. It had to roll in. But it fit in the car. I don't know that I could get the whole studio in the box. It would keep my entire car. If I could do the current studio in the box, that would be better than um, We are hooked up, and, and, uh, and I've got a mic plugged in. So, so we've got, if you look at it, we've got the audio running on there and stuff. And you know, people can come and take a look at it. So, uh, we, uh, like I said, we're, we're going back to Chicago. We're going to, through Amazon to Chicago, and then uh, to one of our control rooms. What's nice is within our plant, we run it as NDI. So it stays, it stays digital all the way till we, till we, not till, till it hits the router, till it hits the cable company, really, pretty much. So it's, um, let's see, what am I forgetting here? Engineer was making notes as we went along. Uh, there's a way we can feedback, uh, uh, IFB through the system. We have uh, um, uh, headsets that we can send along with it. The what's coming up next, and I'll what I'm going to do is close this. So let's. If I can find the mouse. So Jim, the bug in the upper left-hand corner, that's from the studio. Or this one. Yep. No. no. Well, oh, yes, yes. This is coming from the yeah, studio. The I, don't is I don't see that on. No, no, we're not supplying it there. That's coming from the studio. So that's that's what he left up, which is good. It's a, it did said police board meeting last time I looked at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. It's a, um, uh, find my mouse. There it is. Okay. Um, come on, you. I can get this to advance back. Okay, this is uh, this is what this is is the second case. The Panasonic cameras are bigger, so they're not going to fit in that slot. So we needed something else to do that. Right now, with this setup, I, it's it's this case and a camera bag, and it's holding all three tripods in the camera bag. Um, with this setup, we'll move the tripods in there. 
and the three cameras, and we have enough room for, as you can see, is the light kit that's going in there, too. So we'll have all, all of that included in that package. And the two cases will lock together. Um, and so that's, that's the work in progress that we've got going with it. Uh, the next step that's going on is our training folks are starting to work at it and, and develop a training manual that we can send out with, with uh, producers, and then they'll start doing classes and stuff like that with them. So um, let's see if there's anything else there. I think I, think I hit everything. Yeah, there's, this is how to get a hold of me if you want. I can get a, a, a equipment list for you that's that's more accurate than what I've, I've got here. Um, and so you can, if you're trying to figure out what, to, if you're trying to build one yourself or something like that. Um, and that's it. Okay, we can take questions. Um, according to my watch, we kind of, we've kind of run out of time, but uh, if you want to stick around for a few, ask some questions, uh, take, please take a look at uh, the setup we have here. Um, I'm, I, there's just so much with this um, subject that it's kind of hard to, you know, to squeeze it all into the short time we had. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, if we're tomorrow, uh, Patrick and I, along with Bruce Morrison from Castius, are going to talk about streaming and specifically streaming from location, uh, which is, I think, a good add-on to this. Uh, it, says, it says in your packet that it's today, but it's not. They had to move things around, and so it is tomorrow. Um, let me just quickly give you the time. Is it 11.30? Yes. If it says lighting tomorrow, it's... Yes, if it says lighting, it's actually streaming. So, um, okay. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, we appreciate you coming. <laughs>